Okay, so uh, welcome uh, everyone. Uh, this is uh, Nicola Marzari from uh, EPFL, and uh, it's really a great uh, professional and personal pleasure uh, to introduce you today our, uh, I think, 31st uh, distinguished uh, lecture uh, that is uh, Professor Alana Spuruguzek uh, from the University of Toronto in Canada. Uh, I mean, uh, Alan. Uh, received his uh, uh, first degree uh, from UNAM, the National Autonomous University of Mexico. And from then, from there he moved uh, to uh, California, to Berkeley, uh, where he got his uh, PhD in 2004. And then uh, he started as uh, an assistant professor at Harvard in 2006, uh, was promoted to full professor, uh, but he left in 2018, uh, moved to the University of Toronto, where he is now is a professor of chemistry, professor of computer science, uh, Canada 150 research chair in theoretical chemistry, uh, a Canada CIFAR artificial intelligence chair at the Vector Institute, uh, many other appointments, a CIFAR Lebovich fellow in the biological inspired solar energy program, and a Google industrial research chair uh, in quantum computing. Uh, you are all very familiar uh, with his research uh, that spans uh, quantum information, chemistry, machine learning, uh, experimental implementation of quantum computer and quantum simulators uh, for chemical system, uh, driving uh, robotics, uh, experiment, uh, automation and autonomous chemical laboratories, uh, but of course, uh, uh, you know, core effort in electronic structure method, electronic structure simulation. Uh, Editor-in-Chief of the journal Digital Discovery, co-founder of Zapata Computing and Kebotics, and uh, the one that convinced me to join uh, Twitter in 2015. So this concludes the list uh, of honors. Um, and actually, before we start, Alan, apologies, but I use uh, your presence here to do just a 30-second uh, announcement, uh, just because uh, today uh, is a special day for two reasons. Uh, that is, uh, it's the sort of... Uh, uh, early bird uh, deadline uh, to register for the PSYK conference and to be contribute to be considered for contributed talks. Uh, uh, as of this morning, we had already 900 uh, uh, registered participants, uh, but it's really skyrocketing uh, right uh, right now. So, if you're interested, uh, every uh, all the information is at the, this uh, this website. Uh, we might even extend uh, the deadline by a few days as to. Uh, wrap up, uh, uh, you know, some participants that had uh, uh, sort of complexities uh, in the registration. Okay, so with this, uh, Alan, really a great pleasure to have you here. Thanks a lot for accepting and uh, looking very much uh, forward uh, to your talk and lecture. Uh, the well, I, also. Uh, thank you, Nicola. Uh, many of you know I love uh, to hang out in EPFL. Uh, too bad I'm not there in person, but uh, I was just telling Patrick, I will be a uh, I will be an itinerant traveler uh, and try to spend some time in Europe for like a month one day, and then I'll visit you guys. Uh, You're always be... welcome. Okay. Open doors. So we wait uh, for you. Yeah, I do appreciate it. Okay, so uh, I'm going to get started. And I'm going to just make this full screen. And um, yeah, hopefully you guys uh, uh, can see very well. And if there's any issues, just let me know. I, I cannot see you in the Zoom. It's, it's, it's all perfect. Okay. So... Uh, why do I say there is no time for science as usual? Well, let's just begin just uh, with a quote that actually uh, I, I took uh, from, from Swiss researchers, you know, Professor Raymond and also Anatole von Lillenfeld, which is joining us in Toronto. He's already here in Toronto. He used to be in Switzerland as well, via Austria. Uh, they like to talk about the size of chemical space, which is, you know, incredible. Uh, the visible universe has about 10 to the 82 atoms. This is a view from Canada of the visible universe, uh, and the number of possible molecules that you can make dwarfs that to the point that there's about 10 to the 180 synthesizable molecules. And of course, within that, there's also, uh, for Nicola and other people's research, of course, also the state of all possible materials as well in that space, right, which are basically uh, another type of, you know, periodic uh, or non-periodic even uh, array of, 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 of molecules more in the solid, of atoms in the solid state. So it is fascinating, right? This is kind of like, how can we explore that space? It's something that many, many researchers in Switzerland, including Nicola, many others, Clemens Kornibuf, and others are actually pioneers and leaders. So uh, 
I am talking to the experts. Uh, but you can see here, uh, first, the real experts are my, my group members here. Uh, these photos are a little bit outdated. I have to, 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 to take uh, newer ones as well. But this is my group. Once we started getting together back from the pandemic and our pre-pandemic like Zoom picture, these are the people that did all the work I'm talking to you about. So you might say, well, what does my lab do? You know, my lab is called the Matter Lab now since I moved to Toronto. And I would say my lab uh, basically has a, a few topics, but uh, since the early days, and this is how I know Nicola, we both have a passion of accelerating Matthias' discovery. And uh, I also have worked for a long time on algorithms for near-term quantum computers. If I have time at the very end of this talk, I'll tell you just a little bit of an update, but I might skip that piece uh, depending on, on the time. Um, so this is a big issue, right? I mean, um, just today, May 31st, is the hottest May 31st in Toronto ever. 31 degrees Celsius, okay? Um, and you guys, uh, also yesterday, a hurricane hit Mexico, the largest category two, it's a category two, the largest hurricane that has ever hit Mexico at this time of the year. And I'm from Mexico. So sorry for, uh, pardon my, my rude English, we're fucked, right? Like we need to do something. That is the reason of the title of there is no time for science as usual. I just recently saw in Twitter, and I haven't really looked at the at the sources, but I really like the sort so, some statement that again I, I took a screenshot. I really have to study if it's true. It came from a scientist that looks reputable, but I have to study it. Uh, he or she said that sixty percent of the climate change wedge that we need to do comes from materials that are or on there are sorry from technologies that are still not fully finished. I thought it was a way smaller because people keep saying. Well, we have already the technology, we just need to deploy it. That is correct. But I think in some of the estimates that people are making of what we need to do to climate change, they still assume R&D is going. Therefore, we need to accelerate R&D. We cannot do R&D the same way we've been doing R&D. And this is my biggest message to you. If you don't take anything else from this talk, it's the urgency of changing the way our laboratories look. Okay? Because if you take an idea, for example, the laser, the solar cell, the OLED, it will take about 10 to 25 years to bring it to market. And I, in the Q&A, I could bring up some slides I have uh, for examples of that. But you know, uh, how can we make it maybe one or two years, right? That's the idea. And, and I've been working on it uh, furiously since I realized computers are not just a solution, okay? So computers and, and high throughput screening and AI are only gonna take us halfway. The other half, is reimagining the laboratory, okay? The other half is actually taking the laboratory process and uh, optimizing it in such a way that every experiment is done fast, but also is done in a smart way that the data is going into the AI to think about what's the next thing to do. That's why I like to call it a self-driving laboratory, right? One important thing to think about this is uh, the interface for robots, for example, the company ChemSpeed, that I actually uh, you have equipment from. I'll show you some videos and comes to this in Switzerland. The interface is kind of almost built for using spreadsheets to actually run experiments and tables, right? It's, we had to hack the system and write Python's code to actually run it in a self-driving mode. And we'll publish a paper very soon about that, right? But that tells you kind of, uh, you know, the, the kinds of changes that, that you have to do to actually run in self-driving mode again. So more on that later. So let's just begin with machine learning. Uh, this paper is now my most cited paper, right? It's an, it's an interesting paper. You know, all the people here went on to reputa, very reputable careers. David was a postdoc at the time at Harvard when I was there. Now he's a professor here at the University of Toronto who recruited me here, actually, when I moved here after Trump was elected. Dougal is one of the main authors of JAX, the differentiable code at Google. Rafa is now a professor at MIT. Uh, Jorge is an, uh, now in the pharma industry. Team works at Zapata Computing. Brian Adams was at Harvard then went to Twitter. Now he's a professor at uh, in Princeton. So this paper that I really like took this kind of idea of cheminformatics and modernized it and made it a deep learning type of idea. 
the random bits that are actually done at different length scales of the molecule, atom, bond, next nearest neighbor, and next next nearest neighbor, are hashed in a vector here. Whereas here with high hidden weight matrices, softmax the thing, make it differentiable in such a way that the output is a real value vector rather than a real, like a bit string vector. And therefore we can train this convolutional graph to actually able to, to, to look at molecules. And you know, this original idea has been, you know, replicated millions of times, extended uh, by several groups around the world, right? This is another idea where we were quite lucky to be uh, perhaps the first ones or one of the first ones to use uh, autoencoders, as they're called, but more in general, we, uh, generative models for molecular nanomaterials design. So this paper was in the archive in 2016, and thanks to reviewer number three and four, probably, or whatever, we ended up uh, published in 2018. But it's around the same time when we actually thought of, let's take uh, machine learning models that are generative in nature. In this case, you can see here the latent space of an autoencoder, and use them to actually map to a property in other words, the cool thing is mapping the latent space to the property. That's what we did in this paper. And then you can climb the property or properties and then come down project into the latent space. And the most important thing of this network is the decoder that allows you to go back from the latent space back to the structure. Okay. So generative models are here to stay. And again, this is also probably my second most cited paper or whatever. So very, very recent papers that have become very popular because of that. So um, I am not married to any generative algorithm. Uh, this is not the talk in which I'm going to be fighting with you if you prefer genetic algorithms or if you prefer genetic, generative adversarial networks or autoencoders. A lot of credit goes even to a lot of materials people like Alex Unger that were using genetic algorithms before all this AI was so cool, right? So genetic algorithms have been all, you know, now they are called evolutionary strategies and, 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 and they are pretty powerful and we, we have modernized a lot of them uh, in my group. Uh, with a package called Janus and other things you can download. But it doesn't really matter which one you decide to use. They are going to be, in general, sampling chemical space as if, as if it was a statistical function. Think of a generative model as a sampler, the same way Monte Carlo molecular dynamics sample from the Boltzmann distribution. These guys are sampling from the, from the distribution of potential materials or molecules. And what's really cool about it is that the same way, say, transition path sampling or other sampling methods like metadynamics also invented in Switzerland, right? Uh, metadynamics uh, do is try to bias the distribution, the equilibrium distribution. You can use these optimization strategies uh, or reinforcement learning strategies, et cetera, to bias your sampling towards the solution space. It's a lot of connections to what we always do in, in regular science, okay? Now, if you take a look at, okay, what's the impact well, you have to actually show that these generative models are not just BS, that actually you can use them for something. So that's why this is also one of my favorite papers of my career, this paper with Alex Shaboronko from In Silico Medicine, where we use a generative model, like of the types that we like to use, a lot of filtering, but also uh, parallel human synthesis and then uh, assays all the way down to rats. And in 46 days, we were able to do uh, 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 show that you can, create a, a lead candidate for drug discovery. So you might say, well, Alan, come on, that paper was just an, an academic demonstration against a simple receptor. Well, next year, uh, the group of MIT uh, by Regina Barzilai and her co-workers did this for antibiotics. And then just this year, uh, there was a huge announcement of, of Alex Shavoronko and his team. Uh, they have already two drugs, okay, two announcements. They have two drugs already in human testing using this technology and several other companies and groups have shown AI driven drug discovery. Also some many people in Switzerland as well since then. MIT Technology Review uh, mentioned uh, my companies and my group and also of course other groups as part of the co contributors to this breakthrough technology nomination in 2020. Okay, so what is state of the art? This is a paper from last year that kind of like shows the state of the art in my lab. Also, of course, a group of Baron Smith uh, very important group to mention in the wonderful world of, uh, of reticular materials or metal organic frameworks or zeolites. In this work with uh, Randy Snuer, Omar Farha, Tom Gu and others, uh, we basically built an autoencoder, 
like the one I showed you to design molecules for drugs for designing uh, materials. And in this case, we show uh, predicted molecular materials, sorry, uh, sorry, reticular materials. And this is harder, right? Because we kind of have to generate something that kind of looks like a crystal, like periodicity, but also has to look like a molecule, right? So we kind of mix the representation. This is a lot of work by the group of Randy Snor. But I'm very proud of this paper because it shows you kind of the power of generative models for, for these periodic materials. And we have also worked on solid state materials uh, with people like um, 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 the KAIST group of uh, uh, and, and many, 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 many uh, of, of uh, Yu Song Jung and many other collaborators. Um, so now molecular and or materials representations. I argue the representation is more important than the model, okay? As I told you, many models saturate. And it doesn't really matter perhaps what generative model you use all the time or et cetera, but the representation may have a big impact. I would like to say a lot of work is recently given, given done for three-dimensional representations that respect symmetries, but a lot of can be done with very simple representations. And ultimately the representation that we wanna to go to is the wave function. And therefore this is where quantum computers, for example, learning directly on the wave function might be able to combine quantum computing with machine learning for materials design one of my dreams. Um, I started a company on quantum computing, uh, a para computing, and a company on materials design, Kibotics. My dream is one day they merge and then they just work together. Um, uh, anyway, so this is kind of like the kinds of, uh, the kinds of uh, uh, representations that you can think about depending, depending on your problem at hand. And that's gonna be the biggest uh, impact, I think, on, on the uh, ability of your machine learning model to, to, to be useful. Okay, so I'll tell you one in which we are really, really uh, um, working very hard in Toronto and we have many extensions coming up. So first, let's just remember the SMILES representation for molecules. I mean, pretty important representation. You can see here the MDMA molecule uh, represented by SMILES and you can see the string. The branches are represented by parentheses and so on. There are no semantic constraints here. And there are no branch and ring constraints. and uh, just by definition, if you have this one-dimensional strings that transverse a graph, it's very, very, very hard to make them unique, okay? So that will happen also to the representation I'll tell you about. But what really sucks here is that this doesn't understand the context of where you are in the, in the so-called so 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 program. So strings are related to language and to programming. Therefore, you can think about building a better programming language to program molecules. And if you think about it this way and read Noam Chomsky and you're a smart person like Mario Kren, which now works at the Mass Planck Institute for Light as a junior group leader, uh, Mario was thinking about quantum optical graphs, graphs to represent quantum optical experiments. He came to group meeting and saw the selfies, the smiles, which is a representation that has been going on since the 1980s and said, oh my God, look how barbaric is that? Let's make a table that defines what are the chemical rules. And let's imagine that the symbols now are dependent on where they are on the table, right? In such a way that, uh, and also operator overloading, some symbols might represent numbers at the same time as other structural symbols. So depending where you are, you might be expecting a number or you might be expecting a, a, an atom or, 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 a, or, or an end symbol. And all of these will allow you to scramble these strings and whatever string you do, it's gonna be a valid molecule. Again, very, very important. Scramble the strings, whatever string you actually look at, it's gonna be a valid molecule. And of course you can try to extend this to materials as well. But that, this allows you to then not waste any neurons. And this, now we're talking about human neurons, but also computational deep learning neurons in, in just thinking about the syntax of the smiles. And you can see here the first eight dimensions of a latent space, red means invalid molecules, green means valid molecules. How much you waste in, in chemical space? just trying to generate invalid molecules. You can see two orders of magnitude better diversity when you use the selfies. And you can also show how the diversity of molecules generated by a generative beside beside network is so much better for selfies. So selfies are here to stay, are better than the smiles. Uh, they're a single package. You can just download, pip, install it, and convert any smiles and selfies and vice versa. So I argue, and this is controversial, but I argue, why are you doing deep learning with smiles? You're wasting your time use selfies, okay? And as an example, uh, this paper is in press in Nature Communications. 
uh, Daniel Flanschepper, uh, Kevin Shu from my lab, we're able to actually use uh, telophys to generate molecules atom by atom that are the size of a protein. Okay, these are samples of molecules that you know even are the key to know how to render very well. But these are really protein-like fragments where we can use very simple models like RNN models, uh, not even you know transformers or GPT-3 or anything fancy. We're using very, 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 very simple, as we call this paper, keep it simple with selfies, very simple models, at, at, and we can still generate extremely large molecules. This is the record, okay? If you start using autoencoders, turns out they fail for these very, very large molecules. So I argue perhaps the best thing, you pick a good representation, this 100% representable string, and then you can generate very large molecules. There are better representations for small 3D, right? But this is a very good representation for large uh, molecules. Okay, so for the second part of this talk, and I'm gonna spend more time on it, I wanna to talk to you about the concept of self-driving laboratories. So just to kind of just conclude the last talk, great progress on AI. I gave you just a few highlights of what my lab is doing. There's a lot of stuff that we're doing on the graphs that's gonna come out. And of course, I didn't show you examples of the beautiful work of many, many other labs, okay? Which I bet you they will tell you about as well. So I just want to acknowledge uh, this is a very, very growing field. And in the advertisement department, uh, Nicole already mentioned it, we do have a journal called Digital Discovery from the Royal Society of Chemistry. It's gold open access, at least for the next couple of years. We really invite anybody in this audience to invite us to send us papers, right? We are doing a lot of work to try to make the journal cool. There's data reviewers. Uh, you can also opt in for open review. So just write down digital discovery and send us your best machine learning papers or self-driving lab papers in chemistry, materials, science, biology. Okay, so now let's talk about the self-driving laboratory concept, right? So what the heck is a self-driving laboratory? So now also in Switzerland, by the way, Loic Roth started a company there that works on this space as well. Um, uh, Florian uh, is now in Germany uh, working for a large chemical company. But this is a review paper uh, that has experimental planning uh, algorithms. In this case, you can see some Bayesian models co combined with control software to run the robotic platform. So now I became an experimentalist, right? So it's kind of cool, it's kind of fun. And I, many other people have done that in this, in this space. Uh, uh, and what is cool about that is that we can think of the lab as a GPU, right? So don't be afraid if you're an experimental a theoretician or computational person to start moving into this space of building software for labs. It's quite fun. But now more mathematically, what is the difference between a self-driving lab and other things? So I told you about the spreadsheets, right? So the spreadsheet-based approach from the 1990s, uh, CMIX, and uh, was one of the top companies in this space. Uh, they just basically make a grid, and in that grid, they they basically explore dimensional space. You can do things like the sign of experiments, and then you explore chemical spaces, right, to find good molecules. It is kind of the American AR-15 approach, right? If you have a lot of molecules, uh, a lot of uh, resources, then run a lot of molecules. I told you about the generative models. What does that mean here? That means that, for example, this is what we did with silico, right? And it's done in pharma a lot. You have the generative model, they give you some molecules, you explore chemical space, but every time you do it, you go back and do a manual experiment, right? Or maybe even an automated experiment, but then you take that molecule that came from the generative model and test it in chemical space. If you link that also to optimization over the different samples in your experiment and close, put everything together, right? That's what we like to call a self-driving lab. So say there's an initial guess by a generative model, perhaps. Then you go in there, explore the space, uh, optimize your reaction conditions, optimize everything that can be optimized in the experiment in, in a closed loop manner, which means every time data, new data comes in, you feed it back into your models and up update the models. That's what we like to call a self driving lab. Right? So it's kind of a progression of, of intellectual uh, complexity. Uh, the kind of software that goes into it is kind of complicated. You, you need to have like databases, I'll show you some videos of some databases, automated experimental control, Delta machine learning as it's called, um, or, you know, dynamic bias corrections, uh, HPC, et cetera, right? So you really have to, uh, you know, automate your laboratory that way. So now let me tell you a story of a material, right? That we're working on, it's called the organic lace. So let's talk about materials, right? 
So firstly, let's think about uh, the fact that, you know, usually lasers are made with, you know, you have a, a, a very rare element like yttrium, say, uh, in a solid state material, and then you use it as an emitter, right? Uh, but of course, I am an organic guy. I like organic molecules. So I've been working a lot with trying to replace inorganic complexes by organic molecules, as many others, of course, have done. And in particular, I've been obsessed, of course, with OLEDs, right? And uh, I work a lot in OLEDs in my lab, and we, we think a lot about them. Of course, it has some deposition issues and challenges and opportunities. It's super cheap to do roll-to-roll -roll processing. Then the question is, do you evaporate or inkjet and how to do it? But what is very sexy about molecules is you just change a little bit of the structure and the properties change a lot, right? So can we make lasers with molecules? So these molecules will be in the, sol in the, in the, in the solid state. So there are physical chemistry criteria that I'm telling you about today, right now. For example, if you want to minimize the overlap and the absorption of emission, minimize the steady state lifetime, minimize the system crossing. These are all basically things that you can think about in this Jablonski diagram. So you can loop as much as possible the molecules and have stimulated emission um, to have nonlinear response. But obviously, if you have a steady state absorption, shit hits the fan. If you have inter-system crossing and then absorption there, this is a process that you don't want. This is a process that you don't want. You don't want relaxation, um, right? So you really want a molecule that almost looks like an atom, right? So there is a lot of uh, understanding, okay, uh, of what needs to be done. And obviously, we have a lot of quantum chemistry that we can do at the molecular scale to actually screen for this. So we have an advantage in terms of it's easier to screen for this property, say, than in drug discovery, drug ligand binding, arguably. So have people done solid state lasers with organic molecules? This, I will take you to uh, a fraud. So I recommend you, everybody, especially the young people in the audience, they don't know this book. They don't know this story, okay? So young students, go and buy this book today or pirate it on the internet. Do whatever you want, but you can take this book and read about what you should not be doing, <laughs> right? But also how, uh, you know, peer review, supervisory review, open data. There's a lot of things that we can think about here of how never have a Hendrik Schoen again. Okay, this guy was the 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 king of fabric of fabrication, but of fabrication not of samples, but of data, right? So he basically uh, fooled many many people that actually later some of them even became my colleagues at Harvard. Uh, for example, Federico Capasso is mentioned here. Many people for a while were fooled by the, this genius, so to speak, right? But eventually, people like Stephen Forrest and Lin Lu and a lot of people were involved in debunking this guy, right? The laser data, you can you've probably been reading what, I, what this, this thing says, the laser data was uh, BS. This sent back the field a lot because then people were saying, oh, maybe it's impossible to have a, a material that will lace from the solid state. But Professor Chihayadachi, my collaborator and friend, was a postdoc at the time in the forest lab, which was mentioned in the previous slides, uh, pages from the book. And he kept working on it. And in 2017, with Professor Mamada, had, a, had, a, had a, a breakthrough. So it's been about five years since then. And he has published about 10 molecules that have this kind of banana-like, uh, a very large transition dipole, electron density sloshing back and forth that satisfy the criteria for organic lacing in the solid state for a reasonable amount of time. And you can, of course, do tricks to actually extend the lifetime of the molecules. And therefore, Chihaya. It's so gone ho that he started a company called Koala to commercialize this and eventually have all the like materials that lays. So this is the happening field. So when I was moving to Toronto and I was going to start a lab in 2018, I had seen the paper by Mamada and Chihaya. And I said, this is a great opportunity because this is a new field. So let's start the organic laser cell driving laboratory in Toronto. Right? So this is where, besides Chihaya, I have the, the honor of having a weekly call and collaborate with these four gentlemen and their fantastic gentlewomen and gentlemen group uh, that for, conforms the Burke, the Cronin, the Grivowski, and the Hein groups. And we are funded by DARPA, uh, very thankful to DARPA, in a project called Madness. And I would like to say that this is the time for no science as usual also in the fact that you have to do these international collaborations to take the best of each group 
and move as fast as you can. There is no time for ego also. So uh, what we do is we don't do retrosynthesis. It's very popular. We do forward synthetic space. So we take molecular blocks, generate molecules, generate a virtual chemical space of the synthesizable molecules, synth screen over there with AI and quantum chemistry, and then decide which experiments to make. And roughly our throughput is 50 to 200 experiments today maximum. But it gives you an idea of what we can make at, a, at the screening stage for, for organic molecules in our automation systems. So we have a made in Switzerland ChemSpeed robot. Uh, we have a, a fantastic HPLC MS from Thermo Fisher, very sophisticated system. And then we have our home built lasers because it's quite funny for finding out if a molecule is a laser, you need to shine it with a laser. And what you can see here is uh, inline uh, processing so that we can actually start an experiment uh, in a weekend and come back in Monday with 40 samples completely fully tested. Uh, you can see here the absorption and emission spectra of the, of the lasers, the photoluminescence lifetime, uh, all measured in, in line. And this gives you an example of uh, how we can do closed loop characterization uh, for real. And um, there is a chem archive that just put, was put out this, this 2022, great work by Tony Gu, Andres Aguilar Gananda, Jenny Bradsfried, Kazuhiro Hotta, et cetera. And what you can see in this uh, chem archive is the, 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 the whole description of the system and our first runs on it, okay? This is not closed loop, but we did a first run uh, that shows you how things work. Here you have um, caps, and then we were burying this core. We did Suzuki coupling to actually take uh, these caps and couple to 40 derivatives, okay? This is just, show of the first run that was successful closing the, the you know, basically showing end-to-end -end our platform that was enough for a paper uh, that I think is very interesting. And you can see here our uh, automated quantum system, uh, powder dosing. That is probably the, perhaps the most expensive uh, salt and pepper shaker ever, ever made in history, right? It's going to go there and start salt and pepper shaking. Uh, that salt and pepper shaker that has an RFID tag. And you can see here the method to little balance, those in the catalyst and the ligands, that's actually a ligand for a catalyst with a very incredible precision, right? So this is how we use this robot to actually make sure that we powder those uh, in much more precise manner than say the chem speed robots, which can be used for powder dosing at a much more coarser scale. So uh, you also have to learn when to use what robot for what. And I think this is a good example of a excellent powder doser machine that I recommend everybody to use. Um, this is the chem speed. Um, again, decent power dosing, but perhaps it's claim to fame, at least in my lab, is the reactors. So you can see there the arm opening the reactors, and you can see now uh, the kind of more coarse grain powder doser in action. Um, it took us a lot of time to debug that powder doser. So. Again, lesson learned, uh, use an external one if you need more precision, but still pretty good. And then you can always go and, uh, and then now liquid dispense and, uh, and then start uh, making your reaction, right? So uh, you can think, if you guys have an instant pot, instant pot, you can think about that as a parallel instant pot, right? You can also do Schlenk cycles. So I will argue that module, the reactive module is just amazing, right? So. And from behind the robot, you can actually uh, take out the samples and take them to the analysis. Okay. So this gives you guys an idea of, of kind of how my lab looks like at the moment. Uh, but anyway, after we did that, you can see here the 40 experiments on that particular library that was computationally inspired, right? Uh, there was no closed loop again, but uh, good enough to actually show you. This was the gain cross section Basically, how many molecules in a certain area are actually uh, stimulating the meeting? You can see the units there. And uh, you can actually see that we, even in the same run, we already had many, many molecules that have better gain, so better than the state of the art. So we sent a couple to Japan, and Chihaya made a beautiful sample where you can see here both the nonlinearity, and you can also see the neat molecule versus the lazy molecule that has this very, very narrow. Uh, emission band, because it's actually coupled to a cavity, right? And it's very narrow and it looks like an atom, right? And you can see here an important parameter that we also need to learn how to optimize is this excitation energy threshold. We want to lower it as much as possible. That's very device dependent. 
of course, also depends on the molecule. So now I'm going to tell you about what happened with DARPA. So DARPA told us, OK, Alan, you have to show us results. You want to keep being funded, run a real very fast campaign. So we spent a lot of time optimizing. But now we said, let's run a rock star campaign, right? So this campaign is, was called ACDC. And the reason we call it a synchronous cloud-based delocalized closed loop discovery is because uh, we um, are doing it over several labs around the world, as I'll show you. We are shipping powders to each other. I am a Mexican that ships white powders around the world, OK? Um, you can even make a little narco movie about that. So here you can see here uh, our design system. We have caps, bridges, and cores. And by having this combinatorial uh, variety of caps, bridges, and cores, we can access a large chemical space, right? So the bridge is the thing that we added to that particular previous synthesis scheme. But that makes it harder because now we can think about one pot or even sequential synthesis systems where we need to really figure out how to do this quickly. And I haven't told you too much of the organic chemistry here. Uh, in other talks, I talk more about it. But this is a iterative Suzuki coupling scheme of Mira boronates uh, uh, invented by Marty Burke that literally is what we use. We uh, take blocks, uh, protect and deprotect uh, using these boromidas, and therefore we can sequentially build them. Um, the way we do it in the, in, for making this library is a one pod sequence where we uh, first take the caps, which by the way are made by the other labs, by the Cronin and, 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 and Hein labs, couple them to these bridges, and then couple the bridges to the core. And we, we use a trick of using first water-free chemistry and then uh, base chemistry to, uh, with water that allows us to kind of deprotect and then do the second step. So this is how we do it. And that allows us to explore a space of about 163,000 compounds, which you can imagine, you know, with the modern AI quantum chemistry tools, we can certainly even enumerate. We could also explore, you know, um, with uh, uh, Bayesian methods. So here is an enumeration of it uh, by Bartosz Rybowski using his code. But he also has super cool forward synthetic uh, feasibility prediction that allows us to already right off the bat say that about 5,000 of these molecules, and this is basically a lower bound, cannot be made. I mean, his AI says, you know, it's very unlikely to be made with the synthetic conditions that you have due to grouping compatibility and other simple kind of checks. So this allows us to actually not make them and gives us better throughput. But that gives you an idea of what is the connectivity of this chemical space. And now we put all the groups together, uh, the building block preparation, again, UBC and University of Glasgow, excellent work by the computer, by my friend Lee Cronin, my friend Jason Hine works on this optimization condition, uh, um, as well as Urbana Champagne. And then Urbana Champagne and us are more like the, the, the high throughput screening labs. We're sending a lot of powders to each other. And finally, um, uh, we submit the final candidates to Fukuoka with a scale-up done at UBC. So this is really a global uh, effort. And for that, we created this software that we like to call Organize It. By the way, Teofil Godan is in Switzerland. He's my joint student with IBM um, Zurich. So this is an example of another collaboration I have with Switzerland. So Teo built this database uh, of different compounds. Uh, that's a workshop. Sorry, that's a, that is kind of like the working panel. And you can see here this beautiful like kind of user management, but uh, you can also uh, take the blocks and build molecules with the three different fragments, look at the availability of them. And then Teo, of course, uh, allows us to add new robotics machines at different sites. Uh, one of my favorite features of this database is uh, the fact that you can even track the shipping. Okay, so you have all the URLs of the shipping between the different laboratories. And of course, who's doing what? So if you want to do the localized molecular synthesis, you really need to have a system like ACDC to be able to, uh, to make sure you are uh, screening. Uh, and of course, it does have an API, so you don't need to do it by hand. You can, of course, have scripts that populate and depopulate this and so on. And some of the flexing that we've been doing recently, this is an old video. So what you will see in terms of the mass spec and HPSC data very soon is quite old. Uh, and maybe it doesn't even show it, but uh, I think it shows it at the end, but pretty crappy compared to what we have right now, because we have been working a lot in standardizing our analytical data across the different labs, as we have different vendors of equipment. But anyway, this gives you an idea of the kinds of tools that we needed to build to be able to do this asynchronous, delocalized uh, synthesis. 
So now we use Bartosz's technology to actually look at the chemical diversity and then use our first seed experiment for this production system uh, wisely. And for that, I mean, let's just look at the most diverse set of molecules to start our patient exploration of chemical space. And that's what we did with Bartosz. So after that, we're going to feed it into my group's models. I don't have too much time to show them to you. But here are uh, models that we have developed uh, called Griffin, Chimera, Phoenix, uh, Colem, many others. And what these models do is take uh, Bayesian optimization over discrete uh, or categorical variables, as they're called, and continuous variables in the same setting and allow us to actually optimize a lot of experimental conditions. A big trick that uh, maybe the Matthias people want to look at is this Chimera. Uh, take a look at... Uh, Oh, it's not cited here below, but you can check it in this review. But this Chimera uh, work allows you to have a multi, um, basically multi-variable Pareto optimization, right? So like you can say, first optimize the yield, then the turnover, and then the minimize the reaction time and glue the different surfaces together. So you have a single optimizer that looks at the global function, but then you threshold optimize. So, it, there's been a lot of work by combining all of these different things to be able to do reactions. And here is another eye candy. This is the Marty Burke machine. Okay, that's another type of uh, self driving lab that is more bottom up that we also use for the organic lasers. But what I like about this is you can see here how we computer control with Python. This is another one of the contributions of my lab. I uh, take it from LabVIEW to Python. And you can see here uh, the fluorescent molecules being made on the fly with these cheap injection valves in this heater. And this is a way that you can parallelize to hundreds and hundreds of reactions, the same type of chemistry, right? So you can see here, uh, you know, the yellow already starts showing you some fluorescence of the material. So that's kind of cool, right? I mean, immediate kind of uh, satisfaction, I think. It's a lot of satisfaction to see these uh, Suzuki couplings, you know, multi-step Suzuki co couplings done in this machine. So since the campaign started in January 22, here is the original study that I told you about. It's already in the archive. Here is our original point, and you can see here the gain cross section. We're kind of interested around the blue region, but we don't really care too much about the color, but you can just think about that. Here is uh, the diversity seeding. It already gave us better candidates that we all, of course, already are twice as best in terms of gain cross section than the state of the art before. Those are already being scaled and sent to Japan. Iteration was, was more of a diversity iteration. Iteration two was another iteration that had a very nice candidate here. And that's it. And you may say, Alan, why did you stop at iteration two around February? It's already June. Maybe we start around March. It's because since then, we've been increasing our yield. We have about 30% yield of completed reactions. In other words, 70% of the reactions that we suggest for one reason or another are not enough to actually be characterized. So now we have to, I report to you that we have much, much, much better synthetic procedures that I cannot show you now, but that allows us to increase the yield systematically. And those are the ones that we're going to pretty, pretty soon put back into the machine and keep iterating. But we don't want to waste materials. Uh, so we post ourselves and start working on, 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 on optimizing our, our, our chem chemistry. And we're very proud of that. This is a lot of work led by Urbana Champagne and, 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 and UBC, also my lab. But you can see here um, uh, good two good molecules that are being scaled up. And, what is new about it is really a new motif. This is a snake motif for organic laser that I find pretty interesting. The molecules have not looked like this snake before. So I believe these are going to be an interesting set of molecules that we're going to have to uh, be discovering. So you can discover new chemical matter. Okay, so now you say, wow, right? I mean, that's the end of our organic laser. And those were the organic laser molecules lacing with a little fluorescent lamp to you, just in solution. And now I'm gonna spend the last uh, five minutes or so telling you about the automated lab of the future. So though the chem speed and this type of robots is the future, I don't think so, actually. I think the lab of the future is gonna look very different. 
I think the lab of the future is going to look more like this. These robotic arms are their cheap. You can buy them cheaper and cheaper and cheaper. This is a Franca one, not as cheap as it should be, but there are going to the, 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 the cost of these robotic arms because of industrialization is becoming commodity. I predict people were starting to, I want to start having these robotic arms in their house. You know, like a microwave oven, you're going to have a robotic arm doing something. So what is that robot doing there? What that robot was doing is actually taking selfies, taking photos of this beaker. You have these QR codes that you see here to actually calibrate the data set, but obviously they will be later removed. But the idea is that our robot is learning how the heck those chemical glassware look like, full of liquids and not full of liquids. And the reason, is, and also occluded, the reason is that we want these arms to be in the in the unadulterated chemical laboratory. I don't even know if you guys can watch my video, but you can watch my video. I can pick up my glass, drink water, drink my tea, pick up a pen. Everything in my desk is a mess. That's the idea, that you enter a lab that is a mess, and now you have vision. So you're able to actually figure out what the heck is your robot doing. And this is, uh, as, as far as we know, it was the state of the art as a month ago. Somebody already stole the state of the art from us in machine learning. But we had the state of the art for glassware prediction, and we published in the a kind of prestigious machine learning conference called Coral, which is a computer vision conference. Uh, this is work, of course, not done by my group in terms of the uh, expertise of AI. This is the expertise of Animesh Kar and Florian Shkuti, professors of computer science at the University of Toronto that collaborate with me at the Vector Institute as well. But you can see kind of uh, the kinds of things that help my student. Uh, Naruki, uh, Marta are doing. This is Naruki working on the planning stages. You need to plan, so make sure that you do not, uh, uh, you know, basically drop the water or knock back another another glassware, uh, etc. So we are working on the optimization of all of this, uh, and we are building uh, a bartender using this uh, as our first application. So I think this is the law of the future. And with that, I'm going to skip quantum computing. Uh, just to end, I have some time for questions. Uh, but you can see here, uh, I prefer more interactive, so we have more time for questions. But you can see here, uh, again, the pictures of the people that did this work in my lab. Uh, uh, many very important uh, characters here. Uh, as I go along, I'm going to show you some of the most, uh, you know, Mario Crane, uh, Cyril, uh, in terms of the selfies and in terms of the screening. You can see Robert Police. Uh, he's going to go back to Europe as a faculty member. Tony Wu, uh, extraordinary. He built the lab uh, from scratch with many others, including Andres Granda, that is here, and Genia. Uh, Martin uh, has been working on this a lot. Kasu did the later laser system. How Ping did these robotic arms. And I can keep going and going and going, showing you the incredible uh, set of people from my lab that did all this work. So I want to thank them. Uh, and, and if you clap, you clap to them. And, and with that, I'm going to uh, just stop sharing and actually talk to you uh, visually uh, about any questions that you might have. Thank you for your attention. Thanks. Uh, thanks, Alana. Wonderful, uh, wonderful talk uh, again. Uh, so maybe we take a question from the audience. Uh, if uh, Patrick uh, could uh, unmute uh, Magdalena and uh, she can ask uh, directly. So again, for everyone, you type the questions in the question and answers and depending on you, you all, I read them. But uh, okay, here is Magdalena, please. Can you hear me? Yeah. Does it work? Yeah. Sorry. Yes, Magdalena, you want me to read the question or what, why don't you tell me your question verbally? Yes, so, so you can hear me now. Yes. Yeah, perfect. Perf. Sorry, there were some difficulties. So um, thank you very much for this for this talk, um, which was very inspiring for a student like I am. And I wanted to ask something regarding the selfies you mentioned. And at the moment, what um, I've been seeing is that smiles are often used for, for example, transformer models who uh, used for the prediction of molecular properties and as you mentioned, it would be better to use selfies. And I wondered if there is, an, is a way to easily transition those models to use selfies. And also following up on this, how you would envision integrating selfies into the chemical world. Because right now 
smiles are mostly used or taught at university. So yeah, thanks a lot for your thoughts. Well, <laughs> you know, selfies is a couple of years old and smiles is a 30 year old technology, mm -hmm. right? It's kind of like, um, I think if you know electronic structure, I think, I think that uh, uh, smiles is like the LDA uh, approximation for molecular representation. And yeah. obviously uh, smiles is interesting. They have chirality and they have a lot of cases that selfies don't have yet. So we're about, mm -hmm. we're working on the chirality problem at my lab and, and other things that are gonna extend this to organometallics. We recently had a beautiful crowdsource paper where we put together a lot of open problems in the selfies world. But if you use Python and do pip install selfies, in a single line, you can convert the smiles into a selfies and then you try it from machine learning. There is no question that if you do a machine learning paper, you should yeah. have a line that has the selfies in your baselines. There are some cases where the selfies yeah. and the smiles more or less perform equally. Uh, mm -hmm. And there was one group in Europe that was saying the selfies perform worse. I think they were doing the experiments incorrectly. We, we, we are pretty good at, sh at showing the selfies are, are better in the, in the machine learning model. So great to us. If you have any questions, it's just a question of not it being so popular, although mm -hmm. it's the most downloaded paper of the journal MLST. So it is quite popular. We have a lot of stars in GitHub. Uh, and you can contribute okay, to, yeah. the, to the repo. So learn about it. And maybe you, when you teach, when you're a professor in the future, you're going to teach them selfies and forget about the LDA. I mean, historically, smiles will always be important. Mm -hmm. And there's no reason to change the databases. If they're in smiles already, who cares? They're interconvertible. So nobody gives a damn. In my opinion, smiles are great too. I'm just saying selfies are better for machine learning in general. Perhaps there's some edge cases. So all of you should be using them, basically. Okay, yeah, yeah, then that's great. Thank you. <laughs> thanks, uh, thanks, Magdalena. We have uh, um, a question from uh, Ong Bing uh, Zhang. Uh, I realize I should have told uh, people to raise their hand if they want to ask uh, a question live. Uh, so it's never too late, uh, but uh, Ong Bing, uh, please uh, go ahead. Yeah, thank you. Thank you, Alan, for this very uh, inspiring talk. Uh, my question would be, you know, like, um, yes, we can do such kind of automated experimentation for molecules and so on, but what would be your imagination for the solid state materials? Hong Bing, uh, I am reading in the chat, also Professor Rafaela Bonsanti is asking the same question, okay, in different yeah. world, in different mm -hmm. sections. So, uh, well, let me now advertise something, something that we're doing at the University of Toronto. Okay, and we're recruiting junior faculty members. Uh, I'm biting my tongue to talk about that, but also we're recruiting senior faculty members. Anatole von Lillenfeld just joined us. And before Anatole, there was a colleague called Jason Hattrick Simpers that came to do solid state materials. He does alloys and he uses combinatorial solid state synthesis combined with these models. And he has already predicted some of the hardest materials possible, the structure, structural materials. We have a project with the Natural Resource Council of Canada for uh, electrosynthesis of, of uh, OER, oxygen evolution uh, catalysts, oxygen evolution catalysts. So we do have a, I could have shown you a video of our robotic arm doing OER catalysis synthesis. Many people like John Gregoire and many other people are working on those types of solid state materials. So I think that is a great advertisement. We are working in a big vision at the University of Toronto. So for all those of you that wanna do postdoc, come here. Okay, we're going to have a lot of jobs for you. And uh, not only me, but all the professors that are moving here, the junior faculty that we're hiring, and the local faculty, we're arranged ourselves in, a, in an organization called the Acceleration Consortium that made accelerated materials discovery and drug discovery a priority at my university to the point that we're building new laboratories, uh, one for polymers, one for solid state materials, one for drug discovery, one for formulation, and so on very large laboratories. We're actually starting the construction process to have a new space to do this. So uh, to answer your question from being, there are different characteristics for the solid state. It's not as easy because the synthetic aspects are different. You can look at the work of, of Elsa Olivetti at MIT, beautiful work by her on the reading of the natural language processing of the papers to try to figure out synthetic conditions for solid state materials. Uh, but I think, uh, they're apples and oranges uh, a little bit, but at the same time, they share a lot of infrastructure. They are still fruits, okay? And that's what we're trying to uh, acknowledge in the Acceleration Consortium. 
So uh, I will paste in the chat the name of my colleague. You can see his work. There's many other people that do work on this space. Okay. You could invite okay. them as speakers in your in your in your uh, in your series in Margaret. Thank you very much. I'm looking forward to hearing more from you. Well, same same from you. Nice to meet you, Hombin. Cool, Alan. If you continue, I'm going to ask if you are going to hire full professors. Let me go to the next question. Uh, Nicola, uh, uh, any full professor that's interested in that, send me a DM in Twitter. Yes, <laughs> we're hiring full professors. Uh, so uh, just, uh, just, uh, just, just, just do this and we'll, we'll come <laughs> up for you. Okay, you see, this is a public uh, recruitment session. Okay. Yeah. Jishno, <laughs> uh, Jishno, please uh, go ahead uh, with your question. Uh, you have to unmute uh, yourself. Okay, if not, I will read the question, Jishno. Yeah, I'll, 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 I'll read it. No, please, so go ahead. You can answer. So, in your current uh, generative models, uh, uh, what level of accuracy are you using currently? QM, first fields, QSR. Uh, what are the future plans or uh, requirements for large scale searches? So, Jishnu, uh, yeah, machine learning is garbage in, garbage out, right? Like, there are databases that were trained with quantum chemistry data. For example, the ANI database of Adrian Goldberg and Ole Sisajev and Justin Smith is a database of molecules done with quantum chemistry data. This beautiful work out of Japan in PubChem QC, all the PubChem molecules have been completed with quantum chemistry, an incredible heroic effort by our Japanese colleagues, okay? Uh, we sometimes train our models with some empirical methods out of Europe, the beautiful uh, methods by Stefan Grimme are semi-empirical, but they are like incredibly accurate for what they are. So you can really quickly generate data sets that you can train on. And then you can do uh, Delta machine learning, Jishno. You can train on a on a cheaper model and then train a transfer learning model from the lower uh, accuracy to the better one. There's a beautiful paper by Ole Zizayev on that in chemistry where he does transfer learning from DFT to, to a couple cluster. So you can, uh, in principle, train a model with lower accuracy and then you train a very simple model to transfer one to the other. And that can be as simple as a Gaussian process or even a regression, right? Because some, some of these errors are very systematic, as you know. So uh that's how i think about it uh your mileage may vary Jinshinu, but so i'm gonna say in my in my group we use models of all different accuracies depending you in mexico we say if you want to hit a toad the stone depends the size of the stone depends so if it's a big toad big stone etc so you have to there's no right answer or wrong answer you have to use your judgment Cool. Uh, thanks. And just know the connectivity issues. Uh, also, we, we are only using the question and answer not to have to monitor two things. So the chat is blocked. Uh, and uh, Rafaela uh, Bonsanti, thank you for uh, uh, your uh, explanation and information. So I'll read uh, from uh, anonymous uh, attendee. Uh, uh, can you summarize uh, what uh, you hope uh, uh, that you know quantum computing uh, will deliver uh, to our field? Uh, because I think you just uh, passed very quickly over those lines. Yeah, I, I, I'm always very optimistic about how long it takes me to speak, but I also always want to have extra slides, right? You never want to be a speaker that doesn't have enough slides, right? So, but let's talk about quantum, okay? So many as you know, I founded a company called Zapata Computing. Uh, incredible that there's a company with about 100 employees, right? And many other companies like this are doing quantum computing research. But I'm not going around like actually other companies that I'm going to remain unnamed, bragging about quantum chemistry and quantum computers is going to be the solution for tomorrow. Why? Because me and Zapata Computing are responsible people. We know that, yes, quantum computing for molecules in the future is going to be super important because you can solve the Schrodinger equation exactly and not uh, approximately, right? Uh, that it depends when even an ease computer or an error corrected computer, the hardware curve matches the algorithmic curve. We've done extremely good work in many groups, including Zapata, my research group, in lowering and lowering the requirements from the software side. And then the hardware is becoming better and better. Where is that intersection? Three, four, five years from now. Who knows exactly? We work with clients to figure out that in Zapata computing. 
for specific cases professionally, well, we don't go around telling people quantum computers tomorrow will solve your problems. So what is my opinion about quantum computers? Say, if you're in industry, you have to be prepared. For example, what's a paradox with the clients? I'm very proud. Uh, many of you know Mario Andretti. You probably know Mario Andretti, El Piloto. Okay. Uh, Andretti has a race car uh, company. They use Zapata, and therefore there are Zapata Andretti chairs and Zapata logos in the race cars because Zapata built the computational workflow for Andretti. Now you might say, okay, what the heck? Well, there's no quantum computer in the workflow, but it's quantum ready. So Andretti, the day a quantum optimizer is big enough, we flip a button and Andretti will be the first race car company using a quantum computer to optimize their conditions in the road, like a patient optimization type process, right? So companies like Andretti, but also big pharma companies, or et cetera, are preparing themselves. And what my personal company sells is that system that is there already. The difference between our company and others is, is in production already in several companies, including, for example, Coca-Cola, okay? And in certain systems of Coca-Cola Japan, for example, our system is there in production. And therefore, whenever Coca-Cola Japan wants to flip a switch, boom. Uh, it will be able to do quantum computing, right? Not now, in a few years, that's, the, that's what it is. My group, half of it is doing quantum computing because this algorithmic improvement, new algorithms uh, is very helpful. So I know in Switzerland, in Europe, many big efforts to build better quantum computers, better algorithms. So if you're a physicist, a material scientist or a chemist interested in the field, there's a lot of work to do, but be careful of the hype. Science first, money second. I think I'm going to call Ferrari this afternoon. Uh, let's go live uh, with uh, Marco Fornari. Uh, Nicola, if you come visit Toronto, um, you come with me. Actually, we have tickets, okay? We have tickets to go to the Andretti pits and stuff. And for a Fantastic. VIP like you, for a VIP like you, I'll take you to the pits. Uh, so we take a selfie in the pits of Andretti. I'm going to the race. For the first time, I mean, my CEO is going to the races, but I'm going to the race in Toronto coming up in, Ju in July. So if you see me in Twitter, I'll be there taking selfies with the race cars. So, Wonderful. I'm afraid yeah. I still remember him driving uh, the Lotus John Player special. But one of oh. the great moments of my life I was seeing at Honda, uh, you know, the, ra uh, the, the race track where Senna used to used to Oh, drive. Senna da Silva, right? Yeah. Yeah, yeah. Marco, please go ahead. Uh, uh, good morning. So my question is on your uh, strategy to actually deploy a system that uh, synthesizes new chemical, new material from the design to the lab, right? So I'm interested in the next step. So NASA took about 20 years to develop an actual device once the material were designed and synthesized. So the complexity that is in a device is enormously higher and uh, so how do you envision a path to actually deal with this complexity in an automatic way? Thank you. So, so we have a paper in Science Advances. I'll put it on the chat, okay? We, uh, this is work by Berlinget, uh, Hein, and me, led by Berlinget and, and Hein. Uh, but it's, uh, basically, for example, it's a self-driving laboratory for thin films, okay? So I, I didn't have time to show it here in my talk, but I'm putting a link to kind of the NIA, well, the, whatever, you can find it from there. But uh, what we do there is we have a robot that does uh, the position of the molecules in the fin film, and then does four point electrical testing and also checks the, the nature of the film. So in my case, because I work on organic materials, a lot of it is vapor deposition and fin film deposition. And uh, so I have people in my lab working on the robotic device fabrication. And one of the big labs at Toronto will be we call it the formulation lab, but in reality, it's a device lab, right? We will formulate uh, elements of devices and so on. Now, there is a professor, that is, he's my hero. He, I also collaborated with him a little bit, but he also, of course, does much more work by himself. Christoph Brabeck, another excellent person to invite to your seminar series. Christoph is uh, in Erlangen. And what he is doing that is incredible is he has a production plant also in his lab. So he has, Small scale device making. Uh, I have a paper with him in advanced materials on this, but he also has a plant. So I think, Marco, you're to the right point. 
we need to innovate also closer to production, right? So I think that is more green space. Uh, but pioneers like Christoph Brabeck are there in the jungle hacking with their machete, you know? Um, I think uh, we'll have a last uh, question uh, from uh, Kevin Rossi. I know that you have a harder deadline. Alan. Yes, around 11.10, we're interviewing a candidate, one of those <laughs> that I'm telling you, Nicola. So I have to go to one of those uh, talks and, and, and see what, you yeah, know, before yeah, my chair is like, where are you? So, That's but Kevin, uh, what's your question? Thank you very much for the visionary talk. I had a question related to whether uh, you account for any techno-economic analysis or uh, planetary boundaries in the automated lab exploration. Kevin, I love your question. We are obsessed with this, and probably Nicola and many others that we work about materials. The world is becoming a disaster. There is a plot I just saw about the production of plastics, right? The number of the plastic is going to double by 2050. You think about that, the plastic in the environment, all the problems that are going to happen for that. So we need to circularize the economy. We need to degrade. We need to, we need to reuse. Uh, my lab works in a field I haven't told you anything about called organic flow batteries. We're trying to make batteries out of organic materials. That's the next thing I would be probably be talking in 2023 because we started automating it already and we have some preliminary results in the automation version, but we worked very hard with Mike Cassis and Roy Gordon on the field of organic flow batteries. And we believe those batteries will be very important for large scale energy storage, but they have the advantage of converting oil into, into uh, energy storage materials and they are being commercialized. I started getting my, my royalties. Of course, at the startup level, but I got my royalties. It's very happy to get royalties. You can buy yourself new, new sports watches, right? So uh, Kevin, yeah, it's happening, but we're working with an eye on making sure that whatever we do is not toxic, doesn't kill people, etc. For example, our Acceleration Construction Institute has a professor called Michelle Murphy. And what they do is they think about indigenous communities. And what does it mean for the indigenous communities, all the stuff that we're doing in terms of polluting the environment or empowering them to have their own little mini factories. So yes, Kevin, I think we, because the politicians are so self-centered and slow, we, the technocrats and the scientists need to take care of a lot of these things. So I do not like Elon Musk, I have to say personally, publicly, uh, as a person, he looks like a very nasty person. But if we had good versions of him uh, doing a lot of high level, uh, hopefully hairs, for example, many leaders doing a deep tech and innovating uh, for the world in more interesting things than flying to Mars, I think that's bullshit. But just imagine a revolution like that for agriculture or for plastics. I think that's what we need. A lot of companies and visionaries that are working on that. And maybe you or others should be doing that. We do our me, best. Right? We're trying. We're all trying, right? We're all trying. Yeah, we'll do our best. Thank you very much. Thanks, Kevin. Um, Alan, this was fantastic. And I think, uh, you know, the conclusion here on exactly what it means uh, to do, you know, science that brings technology and how it is relevant for the world uh, couldn't be a better one. So I think uh, uh, we we'll leave at this and everyone thinking at, uh, you know, what it means, uh, what they are doing and uh, where, it's, uh, where it's going. Uh, I see a lot of uh, kudos uh, in the in the chat. Uh, Alan, we'll follow you on Twitter. Thanks again. It was a great, great pleasure. And uh, best of luck uh, for everything. And come and visit us. Before we hang up, I'm going to tweet your selfie uh, saying that I was the one that incited you to win Twitter. So smile. Cheers. Okay. <laughs> With your permission, I'll tweet you, okay? Uh, take okay. care, beautiful people. Bye-bye. Uh, see you guys next everyone. time. Everyone. Goodbye. Bye.